Nia Rosiana, member staff of laboratory microbiology, uh, and my colleague, uh, Prof. Ratu Safitri. She is now uh, head of study program of master degree uh, in department biology faculty of natural science. University of Pajajaran, Bandung. Yeah. Uh, actually, she is my junior, but she is also my senior. Yeah. Uh, Prof. Ratu is uh, she is my senior. She has, she has a lot of research and publication uh, because uh, a lot of experience. So she is my senior. Yeah. She will lead the event of uh, this event uh, as moderator. Yeah, please welcome and it's your time, Prof. Ratu. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Yeah, yeah it's you your time, much, uh, uh, Prof. Ratu. Yes, yeah. Thank you very much, Prof. Mia, uh, have introduced me. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, may I have your attention? Uh, the presentation will to begin. Uh, my name is Ratu Safitri, and I'm uh, my function as moderator. Our topic is uh, ethnomicrobiology to metagenomics of ethnic fermented food of Asia. Uh, now, allow me to introduce our lecturer, Professor Dr. Jyoti Prakastama. Yeah. Allow me to read his curriculum. He is a pioneer a researcher in ethnic fermented food and beverages of India and other ASEAN countries, which he scientifically studied and reported uh, till date, focusing on food activity and culture, gastronomy, metataxonomic, metagenomic, metabolomic, bioinformatic, predictive functionality. Uh, structure, culture, development, food safety, probiotic, full genome sequencing uh, of, for last uh, 34 years. Uh, the finding of Prof. Tama have made significant paradigm shift from conventional Sorry. Uh, from conventional uh, Okay. Okay. So, uh, please, uh, you're welcome, Prof. Uh, Tama. Uh, floor is yours. Is it visible? My slide is visible? Yes. Yes. So yes. Slide is visible? This is visible. visible? Uh, yes, okay. visible. Okay. Is it visible? Visible. Thank you. Okay. Uh, namaskar. So, uh, good afternoon to all my old friends and my friends and my students in Indonesia. Now it is uh, quarter to one in Indian time. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, lecture. And I'm very pleased to address uh, my young students and I'm also very Pleased to see my old friend, Professor Tita, okay. Professor Endang, uh, Dr. Sabitri, and others, and so on. And uh, <clears throat> since uh, I visited uh, Indonesia twice in 2013, so mm -hmm. both in the Yogyakarta and uh, Bangdung, and again in the 2019, uh, Professor Endang invited me in Yogyakarta in the ECLAP uh, uh, oh, yeah. conference. Since then, we have not met, uh, though, though we met uh, in 2019, December, in Gujarat, in the Western India. Recording uh, in progress. Uh, and since then, we have not met uh, physically. Uh, everyone is now at home because of the COVID and the corona uh, same. Yes, uh, in Indonesia also, in India also, all over the world. But anyway, the very beautiful part is that 
now we have been connected to the webinar then some uh, you know the the uh, the electronic mood and all before 2019 before uh, the, the covid started in march 2020 a uh, very few of us knew about the webinar and the uh, the google meet and all these things even i did not know about that i never heard about that also forgot about how to use that also so the covid has compelled us to uh, know this uh, thing because we have to we have no alternative but we go on the online teaching online seminar meeting and e meeting everything is online and webinar now we have become at this expert <laughs> at this uh, to some extent that we have learned this uh, electronic media to connect itself now today my talk is a ethno microbiology to metagenomics of ethnic formative foods of uh, asia <clears throat> now this is uh, the <clears throat> this is uh, sikkim university which is uh, uh, the, this is our campus and all and uh, since india is a very big country so uh, we our state is sikkim which is in between the country nepal bhutan and china is a small state in sikkim and uh, <clears throat> Uh, Professor Tida and I think Dr. Savitri they have visited uh, Sikkim in uh, 2015. There was international conference, and this is again talk, and this is the view of uh, Sikkim. Now uh, there are three types of the. <clears throat> uh, I think I have to minimize it. Yeah, there are three types of the global food uh, uh, <clears throat> habits based on the. cereal based diet that is a cooked rice of the eastern food culture the wheat or the barley based bread slops of the western and the australian food culture and sorghum maize origins of africa and south american food culture if you see this map in asia the entire asia rice is very stable food followed by soybeans both fermented and non fermented then the fish and the cereals based uh, alcoholic beverages Which are produced by the Amazon, the Sahara, and all. <clears throat> But if you go to the west, it is not the rice; it is the wheat, the bread, or the barley, or the milk, milk, and many meat like sauces, hemp, and all. It is and the beer and the wine. Wine is a fermented of uh, the grapes. Whereas in the uh, in Asia, the wine is not a culture. Of course, wine is being uh, prepared and consumed. Uh, everywhere now, nowadays in uh, across the world but traditionally there were it was prepared from the rice or the cereal based using by the starter culture and <clears throat> in south america in africa it is not the, the wheat or the rice is the sorghum or the maize is a stable food followed by the meat and the alcoholic beverages and the australian food is very similar to the european food now in india as i told you india is a very big country with a uh, different more than 2000 uh, diverse communities and all so in the eastern part northeast part uh, of india the soybean is very fermented soybean is very prominent and there are many fermented vegetables the bamboo shoot fish meat milk and amyl like starters and the eastern part of uh, india of course rice is uh, very stable but Uh, they have a sweetened milk uh, products uh, and the dry fish alcoholic beverages and the toddy toddy is a fermented coconut uh, uh, milk <clears throat> coconut juice and in the western himalayas it is a, there are uh, several type of the fermented milk products and followed by this uh, fermented cereal products and the legume products in the south india the uh, the gastronomy is a uh, the gastronomy is a study of the food culture and the food habits is very unique uh, than the other parts of the country here it is rice is a mixture of the rice and the legume it is not only the sold rice not only they separate the legume it is a mixture that is what is called the ikki dosa and dokla and this is now very much uh, popular in malaysia then singapore uh, i think in some part of the in indonesia also ikki dosa and all uh <clears throat> wherever the tamil dominated community uh, resides and this is a very unique type of the food this this type of the food has not been observed in any part of the world 
uh, now this is the uh, the uh, the traditional uh, the uh, milk of uh, asia this is indian milk this is a uh, indonesian milk this is a bhutanese milk the chinese japanese and the korean now the food culture indian food is spicy and salt is added directly while cooking seasoning such as soy sauce and monosodium glutamate are never used so whereas in chinese korean japanese foods are not spicy and use soy sauce as a seasoning and other test maker they don't use the salt directly but they, they use the soy sauce european american food is grilled fried roasted and baked tomato ketchup is widely used as a condiment in north america african food is also grilled and steamed drinking of animal milk is not a food culture of ethnic chinese koreans and japanese and many mongolian origin races despite of an evidence of cow in their position i am talking about the traditionally now everybody drinks milk or traditionally or historically instead of the milk soy milk is processed to make a soy milk tofu and the fermented into a number of the ethnic fermented foods whereas in indian european stemetis and the nomadic tribes uh, types of north central asia are traditionally animal milk drinkers nowadays milk is uh, animal milk is consumed all over the world now there are three types of the feeding habits before we go into the details of the food one is by hand the practice of washing hands and mouth before taking meals and after meals were common during vedic period uh, which is a part of the parcel and more than 6000 years ago eating food with the hands has mentioned in the history of the nepal also the chubby dynasty that the historical document is already there now the sitting on the floor well eating uh the with the hand in india sitting in the floor is also a culture traditionally in india in the yogic posture posture the what is called the sukhasans when you when you sit uh, uh, on the floor your stomach is compressed and it it uh, your abdominal muscles are being uh, used and this is what we call the sukhasan which helps to for the, the digestion it activates the blood circulation to lower part of the body and increases availability and digestibility another is use of this chopstick which has been on the 3000 years ago oriental uh, uh, asian for chinese korean japanese use the chopstick for eating which has been of uh, uh, which has been discovered in uh, during shang dynasties around 1300 bc Usually, chopsticks being a more hygienic uh, way of eating, and in the beginning, chopsticks were used only by the king and the, uh, the aristocratic families. But uh, after the Han Dynasty, it has been introduced to the commoners. The last one is the use of the cutlery, the uh, fork, knife, uh, and spoon, and all. This has come only six to uh, one thousand years ago. and uh today set up table cutlery is convenient for eating across the world so if you compare the three different type of the, uh, the feeding practices in the world historically the hand by using the hand is the oldest more than 8000 years and the soft is the 3000s and the cutlery is on the 1000s but today even the asians also we uh, our young generation especially the young generation they prefer to eat by the cutlery what is fermented food any raw materials whether it is a plant or the animal origin is a vegetable or soybean or cereal or animal either milk or fish or meat subject to the microorganisms which there are several type of the beneficial microorganisms which secrete or they produce the microbial enzymes and they convert these complex materials into the simpler materials carbohydrate to uh, different type of the organic acids organic matters then the protein to the amino acids and it enhances the nutritional value and imparts the flavor textures aroma and even the color also which is culturally and organoleptically acceptable by the people is called the fermented foods and if it is it it contains the alcohol it is a alcoholic beverages 
There are more than 5,000 varieties of the major and minor fermented foods in the world, which are used as a stable curry, side dish, fried fish, seasonings, and extra stuff. The ancient people knew how to prepare the food product without the knowledge of the microbiology and the fermentation dynamics to obtain the desirable food products with acceptable sensory properties, I, whether it is in Indonesia or in Philippines or in America, in South America or India, wherever. This is how we define the concept of ethnomicrobiology. Ethnomicrobiology, ethno means the ethnic persons, ethnic persons, the ancient people, that the microbiology is a study of the microorganisms. They did not have a knowledge on the microbiology, but they know how to make tempeh, how to make a tape, or they know how to make dahi. So, but they did not have any knowledge on the microbiology. And this is how we can, we we uh, we uh, we term this ethnomicrobiology in understanding the commentable, the indigenous knowledge of the ethnic people for production of culturally and socially acceptable fermented foods by using all culturally the beneficial microbiota during natural fermentation. There are three types of the global fermentations on the basis of the sensory and the physical uh, properties. As you, as the students, they know the neutral pH, hydrogen ion concentration pH is seven. If the pH goes down, below seven, 6.9, 6.8, 6.4, 5.4, 3, something like that, it is acidic. So in the acidic fermentations, the so mostly the vegetables and the dairy products, the substrate are kept in the airtight container, less or no oxygen to allow lactic acid bacteria to grow on the starchy materials to get the acidic product. And if you should like a kimchi, dundru, and so on, others. So the pH is the below seven. So these are called the acidic fermentations or acidic fermented foods. And in some cases, the pH goes up above seven, seven, 7.2, 7.5, eight, even up to nine. These are called the alkaline fermented food, which contains, which needs the semi anaerobic or the aerobic conditions should be maintained to facilitate the growth of aerobic bacilli, most of the bacillus subtilis, like in tempeh, uh, like in kinema, uh, napo, and fermented soybean product. And there are alcoholic fermentations where alcohol is produced from the sacrification starch glucose and the glycolysis glucose to uh, alcohol and carbon dioxide. Now, <clears throat> for the students, those who are interested to <coughs> study on the fermented food, any fermented food of your country or other country, the students who are interested to do, or the students who would like to do the PhDs on MSc and the fermented food, this is the protocol which I have written in the 2014. So if you follow this, and I think you can uh, do more work on the fermented food. First is the documentation of the indigenous knowledge of the people on traditional preparations how the food is being prepared, how the fermented food is being prepared, you have to record it. And their culinary practices, how it is being made, the mood of consumptions, the ethnic values, what are the ethnic values, social values, whether they have a therapeutic or the medical usage, social economy, the market survey, and whether the product is being sold, if it is sold, what, uh, what type of the income they make it, and how, how do they spend on that, uh, of the marginal producer of the fermented foods. They were using the standard format. You have to make a format. And each and every documentation is being photographed or videographed. Then after that sensory character of the fermented food, when you go and uh, take the uh, information, documentation of the, any fermented food in the village or anywhere. So you get the, uh, the documentation and you see the food. Any food is first, you have to see its textures and its color and how it is appealing, whether it's very appealing, very attractive and all. Then is a flavor or aroma. What type of the aroma? It is a bitter or very appealing flavor or very strong flavor or ebonical flavor and all. Then you have to test it. When you test the food, we have a pituitary gland. 
and it controls the sensory organ, then it gives you the sense of that food, whether that food is bitter, whether that food is uh, salty, whether that food is uh, sweet or acidic or some strong flavor, whatever. Then you feed it, then you can write it. This is very important for the researchers and the fermenter. You have to taste it, what is the food. Then only <clears throat> you can feel it. That is the sensory organ. So that is called the organoleptic characters or the sensory characters. Then you have to calculate the per capita consumption and the annual production of the ethnic fermented foods, how much they eat it. There's a per capita, there's a formula for that. You have to then determination of the pH temperature of the product in situ. Then, then um, bringing it aseptically in the lab, you do the microbiology, then the microbial load, and then microbial load of not only the bacteria, but the yeast molds, because it's a naturally fermented. It has the lactic acid bacteria also, it has the bacillus also, it has, it has the staphylococcus also, it has the yeast also, it has a, uh, the filamentum molds also. Even nowadays in the metatronomy, there, there are bacteriophages, virus also, archaea also. Then there are two methods. One is culture-dependent method, it's a cultural method, and another is a culture-independent method, but directly isolating the DNA from the samples. And <clears throat> then after identification, preservation of the identified strains in the uh, glycerols and minus 80, and experiments of the fermentation dynamics, that is successional changes, is also very important to understand the role of the each and every microorganism, and then determination of nutritional value of the product, and determination of the functional pro properties like the probiotic, immunomodulators, antioxidants, antimicrobial compounds, biopeptides, dietary compounds are very important. <coughs> Nowadays, the recent uh, the topic has come, at is, it is called the metabolomics. The metabolomics, which uh, target, which uh, determines the uh, the metabolites, there are two types of the metabolites targeted and untargeted. I'll explain to you later on in this slide. Then the predictive functionality by the omics by using the bioinformatics. Then study on the food safety. Then the optimization of the process uh, for the scale up by using the starters. Then, then after once you make a new food uh, with the help of the starter culture, then again, you have to subject to the consumers for the organoleptic evaluations. Now, beneficial microbiota, the classification and the, <clears throat> the classical and the conventional textbook on microbiology or the biology of the life science mentioned the pathogenic and the disease causing food uh, poisoning microorganisms, giving the impression of the bad box in the mind of the young students, ignoring the description of the good box of the beneficial microorganism in microbiology textbook, which is rarely mentioned. So this is the <clears throat> scenario now uh, in, in the present context. When you talk about the, uh, for the microbiologists, when you talk about the microbiology, we mostly concentrate on the pathogenic or the disease causing uh, the bacteria or the virus uh, like in Corona and all, you know, but very few have given the, the beneficial effect of the microorganisms. Like in the human being, you also have a good guys, also bad guys. Same in the microorganisms, all are not bad guys. All are not causing the diseases. All are not poisonous. All are not spoilers. But there are very, very good microorganisms which can cure the disease, like the probiotics, the, probiotic, the bacteria, probiotic yeast, and all. Now there are immunomodulators. Uh, there are many um, uh, the microorganisms which has been reported in, like your Rhizopus oligosporos in uh, the golden fungus in the tempe. These are all the good guys. They're all good box. But very few uh, conventional books have mentioned about that. So ethnic fermented foods and beverages, biological hops, for many beneficial life microorganisms, the enhanced nutritional value fortified with the health promoting biotic compounds, vitamins, minerals, producing antioxidants, and so on. <clears throat> so how we study is the ethnomicrobiology practiced by the ancient people, which are produced by the spontaneous natural or the back sloping method, and they get a fermented food. By application of culture independent taking, mostly the metagenomics and the functional metagenomics, and the bioinformatics is very important, because once you get the sequences, it has to be 
uh, is the raw sequences has to be in the readable form or in the tabular form. So this has to be the information has to be decoded into the readable form and the taxonomical assignment and some uh, health benefits. And this is with the help of the bioinformatics and which is uh, the bioinformatics is governed by the machine learning. The machine learning tool, there are the languages of it is very, very important science nowadays because you have to combine with, you have a knowledge in the, uh, uh, the molecular microbiology or the molecular biology. Nowadays, the molecular microbiology uh, uh, alone stand, uh, does not stand anywhere. It should be co-opted or it should be combined with the bioinformatics, the artificial intelligence. Without the knowledge of the bioinformatics, now the nothing, no book papers can be generated and it will not be published in the very high impact factor. So that is why the food microbiologist should know the bioinformatics also. You should have a course in the bioinformatics. Without bioinformatics nowadays, you cannot decode anything also. So you get a complete microbial community that is bacteria, fungi, yeast, virus, archaea, and the predicate gene functionality. Ultimately, it gives the biome which is a microbiome, the bacteria and all, that is a microbiome, yeast and fungi also, then health benefits and the disease profile. What is culture dependent and culture independent? Use of the culture media may ignore several unknown non-culturable microorganisms that may play major or minor functional roles. As in the laboratory now, the, any students, you just collect the food samples and you make a dilutions, <clears throat> then you make a plating, and you incubate in the incubator, and after 24 hours or 48 hours, you see the colonies, different colonies. So these colonies may be the bacterial colony, maybe the yeast colony, or the fungal colony, and all. So you presume that that particular foods contain only this. That is wrong. There are many because this has come because these organisms have been adopted to that culture, to that temperature to that pH. It doesn't mean that the, this food contains only this much of the colonies. There are many organisms, the colonies, which have never appeared on that. These are called the unculturable. Could not adopt or adjust in your cultural media or in that particular temperature or the pH or the composition of the media. So how to detect the whole microorganism? So there is a technique that is direct DNA tracing. You don't have to get a samples, make it a dilutions and plate and all. You directly get a DNA, extract the DNA directly from the sample, tempe sample or any sample, any food sample or in fish sample, anything, directly extract the DNA. Then after that, and that is called the culture independent. That means you don't need any media. And that is now what is frequently used in the food microbiology, the profile, both culturable and unculturable, because you are getting the DNA. The most popular culture dependent method is hydropod sequencing and shotgun sequencing. So uh, the classifications in the fermented food is a lactic acid bacteria, commonly called LA uh, lab. There are 111 bacterial phyla, and pharmacutes is the most abundant phylum in several. Uh, ethnic fermented foods and the beverages, which are followed by the proteolia, protobacteria and the actinobacteria. And there are belonging to the different families, lactobacillus, streptococcus, and so on. So lab are the non spore farmers, gram positive, catalyst negative, without cytochromes and all. And the <clears throat> several lactic acid bacteria have been identified and these are the new nomenclature after 2020. Now, of course, there's a lactobacillus. Some species of the lactobacillus has been classified as a renamed as a lactobacillus, lentilactobacillus, levinolactobacillus, dobiolactobacillus, and so on. So most of the lactic acid bacteria present in the fermented foods are listed in the microbial food culture safety. And this uh, uh, MFC list includes only the safety of beneficial safety microorganism. Among them is the lactoplantibacillus splenterum, previously known as lactobacillus splenterum, is abundantly present in many fermented foods. <coughs> Nomenclature of the mm, lactoplantibacillus kefir and the lactobacillus uh, kefirino 
patients as derived from the KP. And even from the fermented food also, new name has been given the new nomenclature. Then after that is a non-lactic is a bacillus, which is very important. It's a gram-positive endospore forming catalyst of positive, which are mostly present in the fermented soybean foods as a bacillus subtilis and circulates and so on. And they produce the polyglutamic acid, which is an amino acid polymer. And there are micrococcuses, which are gram-positive cocci, aerobic, non-spore forming. And uh, then the, the, which includes the staphylococcus, uh, carmosus, and these are mostly found in the fermented uh, the soybeans and the meat products also. Then other bacteria are the bifidobacteria, Livia, brevibacteria, propylobacteria, which are associated with some probiotic characters and all these are non-lactic, but very important. And the uh, delobibrio bacteria also, uh, bacteria also has also been uh, reported in the exotic dry fish, which is reticulative bacterium. Rumino, uh, Rumileni bacillus has also been reported in the fish product by us, is also uh, called the probiotic. And there are enterobacters and species of arthrobacter, hapnia, and so on. Now, the yeast is also very, very important domains in the uh, fermented foods. It includes the phyla, um, escomycota, mucoromycota, basidomycota, and all. There are about more than 229 yeast genera. The several species have been reported from the fermented foods as the beverages, which include the Britannomyces, Candida, Cryptococcus, and so on. Saccharomyces cerevisiae is the most abundant yeast present in traditional prepared starter cultures or in, in wine and so many other alcoholic beverages. And their main function is the amidolitic, the starch to break down the starch to the glucose, the alcohol productions, sugar fermentations, products from secondary metabolites, and inhibited, uh, inhibitory effect against the mycotoxin producing molds. And the last one, is the, the third is the mycelial filament or the, or the filamentous molds. Uh, the, these fungi are very relatively limited and they belong to the mucoromycota and escomycota phyla. And uh, some of them are the actinomucor, amylomyces, aspergillus, and, uh, uh, and uh, rhizopus, and all. Their function is the production of enzymes and degradation of the anti nutritive factors. Now, besides that, our human body is also composed of the full of microorganisms. The microorganisms present inside us are all very, very helpful. They are beneficial. It is being trans it is, uh, uh, transferred from the wombs to the mother, then to the child, and it goes on. Another. So it stabilizes our entire microbiome, what is called the microbiome, the human microbiome. So in the, if you see right from the toe, uh, from the head to the toe, you find the different type of the microorganisms present. <laughs> if there is a, any disadvantages in this population of the microorganisms, so some unbalance or some uh, disease will develop, like in the cancer, tumor, and so many others and all. Now, <clears throat> now, if you see the gut microbiota, the function of the, the stomachs, it is mostly the Lemino lactobacillus, uteri, lactobacillus debruti, and the small little lemino lactobacillus uteri. And these are, they all have been identified and they, they are present in the stomach, small intestines, and the, in the large intestine as our indigenous microorganisms. And if there is any disturbance in any damage of this microorganism, it causes the disease or uh, the gastric problems or stomach problems or uh, indigestibility and so on. So to stimulate it, we need a probiotics. The probiotics are the organisms, living organisms which are present in some fermented foods. And it may be the bacteria, it may be the yeast and any form of that also. And once it is being administered inside us, they will stimulate, they will activate, and they will be uh, and they will be activated to uh, be our immunomodulators, and uh, the many diseases will be overcome. Also, that is how the probiotics are very important to enhance our gut microbiota. 
Now, what is amplicon sequencing is a method of targeted next generation sequencing that enables you to analyze genetic variation in specific genomic regions. There are two very important sequencing methods. Example is high throughput sequencing, especially refers to the sequencing technique. And another is the metagenomic sequencing. Sequence-based metagenomic involves sequencing and analysis of DNA from the environment. Example is shotgun sequencing. It's a technique in which large pieces of DNA are shared into smaller fragments uh, uh, and, uh, are, and are then sequenced randomly. I'll just give an example of the differences between the high throughput sequence and the shotgun sequence. This is also called the amplicon sequence. This is a metagenomic sequence. Now, in the amplicon sequence, as I told you that the, now the, in the next generation, the DNA is being extracted from samples. And the advantage of the thing is that it will multiple copies of the fragment from the one target gene only. The disadvantage of the high throughput sequence is it will target only one one target. What do you mean a one target gene? Is? Suppose you get, you you target uh, if you uh, extract the DNA and use the primers and it will go in the 16S RNA sequencing. That is only for bacteria. It will not give you the result information on the fungi, not on the virus, not on the thing, only bacteria. So if you want to do the uh, to, <coughs> uh, if you want to do the uh, fungi, again you have to use the different primers. ITS primers and all, that you get a fungal, the yeast and all. Now the scientists have modified this, upgraded this version. It is called the metagenomic sequence. It is called the shotgun sequence. Now in shotgun sequence, you extract the DNA and it such sequences fragment from all DNA. So you don't have to make it the primers for the bacteria or for the yeast or the fungi. One DNA, will give you the sort and the library, you have to make it a library, and that will give the entire domains of bacteria, which includes the lactic acid bacteria, the non-lactic acid, everything, all. Whatever present in that food samples, you'll get all the information. And the eukaryotes, that is yeast, and the fungi, then even you get the virus, and even you get the archaeology. So this is the most uh, latest technique in the metataxonomy of uh, the uh, era, then when you use this subsequent sequencing, you get the entire microbial community structures of that food. Now, what is foodomics? Foodomics is a new discipline that is said the food and the nutrition aspect. So the application of the advanced omics means the bioinformatic techniques, which in, which in turn improve the health consumers. It allows the holistic evaluation of the health benefits of different foods by incorporating data obtained from the genomics, transcriptomics, uh, mix, then proteomics, metabolomics, and to uh, play the significant role. So <coughs> food is the study of the food and the nutrition with the help of the omics, the metabolomics. That so the food contents, I told you that there, there are different types of the bio compounds, immunomodulators, metabolites, and all. Now, the, what is metabolomics? Is a study of a small metabolite present in the involves in the advanced technique, food processing, and the bioinformatics. And there are two types of the metabol metabolomics. One is targeted and untargeted uh, metabolites. The targeted analysis uh, quantifies and the ideal is a special metabolites. Targeted metabolites are mostly the amino acid, fatty acid, and all which are known. Then there are untargeted metabolites, which are very, very important nowadays because untargeted metabolites are small biomolecules which can penetrate through our cell wall and go. And these are untargeted because this has newly discovered. And this untargeted metabolites includes your know, some vitamins, the biotic compounds, and some uh, the immunomodulators, which are very, very important to impart their health promoting benefits and even to uh, combat the, some fatal diseases also. Now, this is the latest uh, of the, <clears throat> the, uh, the subject in the foot microbiology. Now, I told you that bioinformatics is very important. It's a collection, classification, storage of the biochemical and the, uh, biological information. It is also known as the uh, uh, biological computations. It includes computer science, chemistry, engineering, biochemistry, biology, statics, and mathematics. So 
it comprises of so many subjects and all multidisciplinary and it is called the bioinformatics there are 10 different type of the fermented foods in the world fermented vegetables mostly fermented with lactic acid bacteria fermented legumes cereal milk fish meat root amylid starters beverages and miscellaneous fermented foods now i'll go to the origin of soybean soybean has been originated in the northern part of uh, china <coughs> there's a wide variety of the soybeans which are called the glycine soja known as the dao dao du in uh, chinese language appear to have been introduced first in china during jiao dynasty in 700 bc <coughs> <coughs> then after it went to the southern part of china yunnan province and from yunnan province one route went to india to myanmar the northeast india nepal and the other parts and one route went to the korean peninsula like korea and japan and another route went to uh, the laos cambodia thailand and then indonesia singapore the philippines and all So this is how the soybeans have been. Then then the kadale, the modern name for the soybean in Indonesia, uh, in uh, it was known as the kadale, was first mentioned in the Sri Tanjung manuscript, Sera Sri Tanjung, in a story set in the East Java during the 20th, 12th century AD, 12th century AD, and these authors have uh, cited this uh, example. Now the cultivation of soybean in the Himalayas. There are two types of soybean. This is a soybean, and the, these are being fermented and make it into curry, which is commonly called kinema. Then, if you see in the the alkaline fermented, because I told you that the fermented soybean foods are the alkaline. <coughs> Excuse me, I just have a word. <coughs> kasihan juga ya sakit ha? ah sorry sorry i just said <clears throat> you get so huh? so these are these are the different varieties of the fermented soybean products in the uh, eastern part of uh, uh, the, in the himalayan areas uh, <clears throat> the different names and all and these are the different type of the fermented soybean foods of india with the different name kinema hawajar and so on So I will just give an example of the ethnomicrobiology knowledge of the ethnic people for soybean fermentation. How the kinema is prepared, a fermented uh, thing. This is a traditional knowledge. The people did not know anything about microbiology, but they have um, they have invented the production of kinema, which which nowadays in our science, in our knowledge. in our interpretation is a big knowledge it includes the metagenomics it includes all type of the uh, the science soybeans are clean and washed soaked in water then after that they cooked they are cooking they are soaked in water they are so soaked in water then they are cooked in the urban kitchen then added a small uh, firewood as to increase the uh, uh, alkaline uh, to maintain it alkaline nature then it is being wrapped in the bamboo basket with the fern leaves and just anaerobically they semi anaerobically because this is not a lactic fermentation it is not the acidic fermentation there should be the some oxygen to growing for the for, for the growth of the bacillus the people did not know about bacillus people did not know about the semi anaerobic condition but they by practice they knew that how to facilitate the this bacillus to grow on the surface and so that they will make a sticky nature and make a product and fermented kept and fermented uh, at uh, in the room temperatures near the kitchen and they get a kinema and this is a kinema curry <coughs> we took these samples and we now interpreted as this as the publications of this and now we Studied both hydrophobic sequencing and the sugar sequencing. In the hydrophobic sequencing, we did the extreme 16s RNA sequencing and the ITS for the fungi and all. 
And in the sudden sequencing, as I told you that we get all the bad luck. We have got the, the bacteria, the virus, the eukaryote, the yeast, and the fungi, then the, and then uh, archaea also. And there are some unclassified also. So these are the different types of the domains. We could detect it directly from the DNA of the naturally fermented kinema. So during kinema fermentation, several species of bacillus coexist to facilitate the fermentations. The bacillus subtilis is the most <coughs> abundant bacterium followed by 127 species of bacillus. This is a huge, remarkable, novel findings of us. So that means in the, in the particular food kinema, there are more than 120 species of the bacillus on, the, on one genus. So he's a huge diversity. And who have, uh, I have not invented that. It was not our team and all, but our forefathers who have been practicing this kinema, the traditional method, they did not know anything about the bachelor. They did not know anything about the high throughput mm -hmm. sequence and the sudden sequencing and all. This is a tool which is interpreting their ethnomicrobiology. That is why I always term this ethnomicrobiology in terms of the metagenomics, the ancient to the metagenomics. With the metagenomics, we can say that this, the forefathers are so intelligent. They are a real microbiologist that they have cultured this, this type of the microbiology. Now we could decode this uh, more than 127 species. And similarly, we did the metabolomics of kinema. <coughs> then we found that more than 28 compounds were categorized as an untargeted metabolite in kinema, which includes the immunomodulator or immune uh, stimulating effects uh, such as sunsonine, then serotonin, salvative thing, sarpage gene, and biotic compounds such as a hormonal, melatonin. These are all the very, very important even to impact, to cure the cancer also, to, uh, to boost the immunity also. These are all uh, important. The metabolites have been detected in kinema. So we believe that this technique will also, def uh, we also decode many Indonesian ethnic fermented foods, including tempeh also, and very few have been applied on the metabolomics. I have not seen um, on the action in the uh, tempeh and not in the other food and even not in the many food of the, uh, the uh, <coughs> even not in Napo and not in the other food also. So uh, we have been working on this and all. Now the, then recently we uh, identified these uh, lactoplanty bacillus, bacillus uh, uh, lactoplanty bacillus plantarum from Kinema and we did the whole genome sequence and we found the the immunity protein, the red is the immunity protein. So that means the kinema, the fermented soybean product has got there some immunity effect. And it may, because maybe the immunity, of, uh, the immunomodulators, uh, the compound. Similar product like kinema is called the Daochi in Southern China, Tuanao in Thailand, Nato in Japan, and Chungkokjan in Korea. Then if you see this, uh, the triangle, the Napo prepared to kinema and Tuano, it is an imaginary triangle. The, uh, what is I count is as a kinema Napo Tuano triangle. So within this triangle, only the sticky fermented soybean, there are two types of fermenters. One is the bacillus fermented and is a mold that, is, uh, that includes your miso, tempeh and all. But the sticky fermented soybean foods are prepared and consumed only within this country. Japan, Korea, then southern part of China, not entire China, then <coughs> Bhutan, Nepal, and India, in the entire Northeast India, then Myanmar, the northern part of Thailand, and Xiang. Uh, in yeah. the north. Then I think somebody has to unmute. Mute, mute. Dr. Sabedra, please mute the Voice is coming. Achha, anyway, then it is not this for sticky fermented food is not uh, being uh, traditionally prepared in Kampuchea, Vietnam, in, in Indonesia, and Malaysia. Now, <clears throat> the NATO, which is similar to Kinema, NATO of Japan now produced by 
using the monoculture uh, bachelor subtilis is a NAPO. There are many strains of the soft, uh, bachelor subtilis and which has been sequenced. Uh, it has proved to produce a several functional uh, health promoting benefits and there are more than 500 companies of NAPO in Japan. And PIBO is a traditionally fermented alkaline fermented food of Myanmar. And uh, in, uh, in last year, I went to Myanmar and we collected this Myanmar. Nobody has worked on this Myanmar. So we collected, I went to the different villages and in the Mandela, then we collected this, uh, uh, the samples. And these are the traditional methods, which is quite similar to kinema, traditionally prepared. And these are the recipes, they dry it, they fry it, and make it as a curry also. Then we brought to the samples and we did the metagenomics, uh, um, the work. And it's already, <clears throat> and, and we found there's a huge diversity of the bachelors and the other domains. And uh, there is huge, uh, the meta, meta taxonomics, uh, that the functional functionality of uh, the predictive functionalities have been uh, inferred also. <clears throat> And we already communicated this uh, to the plus one, and it is already reviewed, and we are just waiting for the acceptance of this paper. Then another is the Tsumkokjang. Nobody has worked on the metagenomics of Tsumkokjang. So in 2019, uh, I, went, uh, I went to Japan, uh, Korea with my Korean friends and all. We collected this Tsumkokjang traditionally, and <clears throat> we also uh, analyzed the metagenomics uh, and along with the amino acid profiles and all. And we found that uh, the, besides bachelor software, there are so many other species and the organisms present in the Tsumkokjang, which has given the different type of the, the complete paradigm shift on the microbial, uh, the uh, community structures in Tsumkokjang. And we already communicated with the Food Research uh, International, and it is already uh, the, the revised and we're just waiting for the acceptance. Now the fungal fermented tribal foods are the Misho uh, of Japan, then Daoji of China, the Supu, the fermented tofu is called the Supu, then Swash uh, of Japan, Tempeh of Indonesia, then Swash of China, then Dongjung of Korea. Now the Tempeh, Indonesians have historically invented the ethnic uh, uh, ethnomicrobiology to use the golden mold, the rice of uh, Origin to produce a tempeh, a permanent soybean in central and the east Java in Indonesia around about 1800 <clears throat> to BC, uh, 1880. Tempeh has several functional properties, health benefits, and therapeutic uses. And metabolites in tempeh was analyzed by the metabolomics. As I told you, metabolomics by the Kadar et al. has uh, done her work on the metabolomics. And they found that the environmental factors or the raw materials and they contribute to the Kente metabolite uh, uh, profile. And the metagenomic studies of Kente has also been done by the uh, Panga Studi at all 2019, and they <coughs> revealed, uh, <coughs> besides Rhizopus <coughs> mucorellis, it is followed by the, some other fungus, the uh, uh, Triplidopsis, and several other uh, yeast also, like Candida, Cluvoromyces, uh, then Trichosporin, and others. So this is also very important. The tempeh is uh, <clears throat> one of the, uh, the healthiest fermented soybean food uh, nowadays, so not only in Indonesia, in the world. The tempeh, because of the tempeh, uh, because of uh, the Indonesian tempeh now, the, uh, then <clears throat> since Indonesia was a Dutch colony, then Netherlands, and now Netherlands also says that this is our food. That is very good. Okay, we know that it has been historically being <clears throat> uh, adopted from Indonesia, but uh, they also say that it is Dutch, and the tempeh is also very popular in Netherlands also. And because of their popularity in Netherlands, this is popular in other other countries also like uh, like in Germany, the England, then France and all. <clears throat> now there are fermented uh, vegetable products. This is fermented vegetable uh, has been uh, dated back to the Song Dynasty in uh, 960 uh, uh, CE. 
most widely studied is your kimchi of Korea, gundruk and shinki of India and Nepal, pokai of China. The ferment is mostly dominated by the lactobacillus and pretty cocos. And these are the fermented vegetables like gundruk in India. Uh, <clears throat> the radish uh, leaves are being fermented. And this is the kimchi of Korea, saukai of China, then sourful of Germany. And there are several fermented bamboo products also in India. Then this is the traditional method of the of, of production of gundruk. This is, this is another product, shinki. And <coughs> now kimchi was originally or, originated in Korea about 4,000 4, years. And lactic plantivacillus Bacterium in production lactic acid bacterium has been named after kimchi and genomic analysis has been done. Then this is how the kimchi fermentations and kimchi due to the health, the nature of kimchi, it has been recognized as one of the healthiest foods in the world. There are, there are fermented cereal mix, mix of foods of India. And this is how I, I would like to give an example as I told you that this is a very unique example in India. It is fermented rice and the legume mixtures, both rice and the legume mixtures and all. Leavening and the acidification of batters are remarkable changes during Italy dosa fermentations, thereby enhancing the textures and the organoleptic properties of final product. The predominant bacterium was the uh, leuconostat mesenteritis. But recently, <clears throat> by the hydropod sequencing, it was found that the Vivicella is the initiator. So during the drastic changes in the microbial community were observed. <coughs> so we, <coughs> sorry. A drastic succession of changes in the microbial community were observed. Vishela was observed at nine hour the enterococcus and the sugar the 15 hour, then where Vichella was not reported as the main initiator of Italy. So this has changed the paradigm shift. Initially, it was thought that the leuconostal of mesenterology by cultural method was the predominant, but now by the culture independent, next generation sequencing, it is said that the Vichella, this is the result of uh, the, uh, this finding. So they have very high nutritional values that ethnomicrobial knowledge of the ethnic Indian people might have standardized the natural fermentation process of carbohydrate rich rice and the protein rich legume. So this rice legume mixture is carbohydrate and the protein as healthy and the balanced tasty food, which is yet to be studied to interpret the real mechanism of fermentation with the advent of the new sequence taxonomy and photomics. Now there are different types of the Indian fermented cereal like the naan, jalebi, and so on. Then there are different types of the fermented milk product. Uh, in, in these are all the fermented milk products in India, which are known as dahi, lassi, sikan, surti, and all. And this is Iraq of Mongolia. This is uh, prepared from the mere milk and tarak of uh, Mongolia, the pumish of Kazakhstan, and this is dahi of Indonesia. Probably it might have come from Dahi of India. It is called the Dahi of uh, Indonesia. And it is prepared in the bamboo <coughs> vessels. And there are several types of the fermented, natural fermented soybean products in the Himalayans and all. Then we did uh, the both uh, this next generation sequencing and the, uh, the 16 s RNA sequencing. And we, we found that a different type of the lactic acid bacteria and all. And this is how we have compared the culture dependent analysis and the culture independent analysis. With the culture dependent analysis, we could found uh, we could find uh, the limited uh, the lactic acid better, but in the culture dependent, the huge diversity of the microbial communities. And the probiotics, uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to details of the probiotics of this. There some of the microorganisms have the probiotic properties and all. And I'll just tell the students how to do that. The probiotic is one is the uh, one is in the in vitro, like you do the acidification, bile test, the lysosome, this and that. Um, that but you have to do the genetic <clears throat> genetic uh, uh, detections also, gene detections also. This is also very important and all. Then recently we have devised the uh, these systems to select 
on the basis of using the software, we selected on the basis of the in vitro and the genetic uh, analysis and even the whole genome sequencing also. So how to select the best? Initially, what we do is the selection is based on the data. But now we use the, uh, the statistical and that could be the, the correct uh, selection procedures for the, uh, the probiotic candidates. So we have done that and we are yet to publish the paper and we are communicating that. And I think once we publish that, it will be good for, for the students to follow that paper. Now the origin of fermented uh, fish. This is a Mekon Bell, Mekon River. I think you know the Mekon River. The Mekon River Basin is a transborder river in the Southeast Asia and runs from the Tibetan Plateau in China, the China's Yunnan province, Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, and Vietnam for the Mekon countries. It's the most probable place of the origin of fermented fish product in Asia. And this is how the Mekon goes and all. And along these valleys, the, it is believed that the fermented fish has been originated in these uh, valleys. So in India also, there are uh, several types of the fish products, uh, the citra, the tumta, uh, then sukuti and all. Then this is the sital of Bangladesh. This is the budu of Malaysia. This is the bakansang of uh, Indonesia. This is the nampla of uh, Thailand. And uh, so these are the Okay, Then <clears throat> these are all publications. Then we did the food safety also. No intertoxins were detected. Most of the strains were sensitive to all classes of antibodies, uh, antibiotics. Hence, we are, hence they are safe. The traditionally fermented fish, the people say that are, are they safe for consumption? So we tested this on the uh, genetic, uh, on the gene detections and all. Then we found that they are safe for the consumption of roasting frying and boiling. Now there are several types of the fermented uh, smoked meat products also, like in America, it is sauces, salami. Like in India, there are several types of the fermented uh, of the sauces or the meat products, like the sauces, be the Karjim or Sikkim, Nam of Thailand. And these are all the publications we did it. And we did uh, the hydroport sequencing also. Now the amyla started, as I told you, the wine and the tea are not the traditional cultures. But the Asian peoples used to drink the alcohol using uh, the uh, stars as a, uh, the cereal as a main substrate and adding the starter cultures. These are called the Rahi of Indonesia. The similar type of product in India is a Marta, Nuruk of Korea. All, all of them look very similar, but they are produced in the different countries with the, uh, with the slight variations in their method of preparations. <clears throat> So in India only, we have a varieties of the different um, varieties of the amyloidic starters. And with the help of the, uh, the, um, the uh, hydroport sequencing and all, when we did the ITS-PCR, we could select in MARSA, in, in the amyloidic starters of India, we could detect under six species. When we apply the DGG-PCR, we could get 18 yeast species and six mold species. And when we apply the high support sequencing, we got a 954 species, including the 83 yeast species and the five, uh, 511 mold species. So high support sequence is very, very powerful. Even uh, the, the next generation sequencing is very important. Uh, to uh, to profile the microbial community in the particle of food. And we did the yeast also, the melamine molds and the amylase and the alcohol production yeast, mostly belong to the phyla, phylum escomycota, followed by the uh, other phyla, uh, mucoromycota and the basidomycota. Among bacteria, dominant phylum is amicutus and all. So these are all the publications and all. I'm not going to do that. And we did uh, some uh, the probiotic properties of the lactic acid bacteria from the traditionally prepared dry starters also. Now this is the product because in the Himalayan, uh, the finger millet is very popular and it is being fermented into the beverage. It is called the protogozar where it has uh, the vitamin B12, amino acids. Uh, there are several amino acids. It's a high calorie content to regain the strength of the post-natural and the alkyl portion, the alcohol portion is only 
than bioavailability of the minerals uh, such as calcium, potassium, and all. And <clears throat> now another very popular uh, drink is the toddy, the fermented palm uh, drink uh, production in India. This is how the palm is being trapped and fermented is a traditional method and it is uh, shown in most of the Asian countries, mostly in the coastal regions and all. So we did the uh, hydroport sequencing and now we found the different varieties of the different communities, microbial communities in Todi and all. Now the sake is uh, the very most popular alcoholic drink in Japan, uh, which is regarded as a national drink of Japan and makuli, the fermented rice product is also very popular in Korea. Then the buju, uh, buju of China is also very popular in China. Now this is an example. I first give my thanks to my friend, Professor Tida and Gilang and others. When I visited in 2013, <clears throat> I, was, uh, <clears throat> I was taken to one village. <clears throat> I forgot the name of this village near in Bangdung. Then where the villagers are collecting the cassava because it's a cassava growing area. Then traditionally this cassava uh, is being fermented into an alcoholic beverage, tapa katen. But nowadays, because of the religious taboo, uh, the alcohol is, uh, of course, alcohol has been consumed in Indonesia traditionally, but nowadays the people prefer not to drink that. So what they have done is, this is a very, very important, innovative ethnomicrobiological knowledge of Indonesian people. I always appreciate, and wherever I go in any part of the world, I always appreciate the initiative of the Indonesian people, how they have done. I'll just explain you. This is a cassava, it's a full of starch. Actually, cassava traditionally is permitted to make an alcoholic drink, tape cattle. But nowadays, the alcohol is not being produced. So during the productions, there are two steps. One is the sacrification, a sacrification, liquefactions, and the alcohol productions. So cassava are collected, boiled, and they are, they are boiled, and they are mixed with the starter cultures, they call it the ragi, which contains the molds, which contains the, uh, the yeast, and they are packed in the bamboo basket lined by the banana leaves, and they are packed. And after that, they are packed like this, and after that, they are loosely packed. Not the air type, not like in the kimchi, not in the air type, loosely packed. And after one day, after one day, the next day, you find that this cassava, the fresh cassava is covered with a whitish, uh, the mycelia. So these are all the mycelia of the molds and some yeast also. So if you test it, if you test this cassava, cassava is slightly bitter, not so the fresh uh, cassava. But if you test this cassava after the sacrification, sacrification means when the starch is broken down to the glucose. So this is full of starch and this is full of glucose and which is very sweet. And if you test it, it is very, very sweet. Then after that, the fermentation is squeezed. Then even if traditionally, after this uh, the sacrification, they are packed in the bag and make it for the alcoholic fermentation that is glycolysis. The starch is broken down into the alcohol and emitted some carbon dioxide, that is tape cattle. So which is now quench, which is stock. So what is this product is now, this product, then I saw a big van, big refrigerator van uh, outside the road, outside the village in the parking in the, uh, in the road. Then I think I asked Gilang, why this, has, uh, this uh, big bands have come here in the village? Why? Then they said that they have come to get this. So they are all coming from the bakeries companies from Jakarta, the Bangdung, some other big cities and all. So they buy it directly from the villages, they pay it, and this is being substituted as a sugar while making a bakery. So bakeries in Bangdung and Jakarta, most of the bakeries and all, they don't use the artificial sugar. They use the natural sugar. This is a glucose coming from the cassava and fermented by your mold or the yeast. This is a marvelous thing. I must salute to 
my Indonesian friends, my farmers. I think you have to tell your government, Professor Tita and Professor Endang and Professor Sajitri and all, please highlight this in the international. And wherever I go, I always, and I even I have told this to the UN uh, FAO also, and the UNDP also, you please visit to Bandung and make this as an example of this. And there are the different types of miscellaneous fermented foods like the vinegar, as you know, the pidang is a fermented uh, egg, then nata, then coca, coca, the chocolate. Now this is myang is a fermented tea of Thailand. And in China is a kombucha. Kombucha is called the sea treasure. And this is a nata de coca of <coughs> coconut desert. And this is the pidang, the fermented egg of China. Now, if you see the health benefits of all the fermented foods have got several health benefits that protect from hypertension, the nutrients uh, synthesis by availability of nutrients, they lower the uh, cholesterol, <coughs> blood cholesterol, cancer prevention, protection from diabetes, source of antibiotics, and so on. So <clears throat> in our recent uh, publications, we compared the, uh, the traditional method, the traditional fermented food, and the modern food. So in the traditional food, it's a small scale craft industries, is a large scale in the factories. In the traditional methods, usually the bag, tanks, the traditional utensils are exposed and open in food. Whereas in the modern bag tanks, includes and the aseptic conditions is maintained. Then they're mostly in the stainless steel. Then here the wrapping materials are used, uh, the leaves and the straw are used as the wrapping materials. There's the plastic, other clean barriers for the packaging. It is done manually, but in the modern, it is automatic. The variable fermentation times is a consistent at the predictable fermentation time uh, controlled by the uh, computer. And there is a varying quality. Sometimes uh, the, it, based, uh, it is a trial and error, but it's a consistent, consistent quality. Quality is same in the modern food industries. Safety and hygiene less appreciated. Safety and hygiene are the top priority. The no culture knowledge, their extensive culture knowledge, that means here in the tradition, which type of the organisms we are using, but in the modern, we, we, we should know the which type of the starter cultures we are using. So there are more advantages and disadvantages, but whatever it is, my conclusion is, ethnomycology knowledge of the ethnic people is highly commentable and ensures the choice of the substrate and creates a conducive food ecosystems to obtain the desirable, sensory, acceptable, and nutritive food products. Hence, based on the ethnomicrobiology knowledge of the ethnic people, the application of the modern food microbiology, including the sequence-based taxonomy and analysis of the biotech compounds and the immunomodulators present in the ethnic formative foods by metabolomics and other omics tools may validate the worth ethnomicrobiology knowledge of the ethnic people of Asia. So in <clears throat> our university department of microbiology, we have one paper, it's a food microbiology. Uh, and there are four units and the students have to uh, study the fermented foods and the beverages. And the students have to study the kimchi also, tempeh also, and so on. So these are the books which are written by me. Uh, I think uh, most of you know about this, the Himalayan fermented foods and uh, then what fermented food health benefits of the fermented foods uh, uh, and beverages and so on. So this is uh, our team, the postdoc and the PhD students in our laboratory. And this is my entire team. They are my ex students, uh, but all of them, are, uh, some of them are placed into some universities, some colleges, some industries and all. But after all, it is a team. Team is always appreciated. You cannot do a single person. It is always a team spirit. So team spirit is very important to <clears throat> make uh, any research protocol. So you need a team and the team has to be propagated. And wherever I go, I want to always encourage the young students, always you should have a team spirit. And whatever I am, I want to propagate to others also. If there is one tamang, and if there are two tamangs, 
And if there are 100 tamams, and that will be, uh, I think, the our whole scientific community or the fraternity, especially the foot microbiology, becomes very, very strong. And at the same time, we can promote, we can preserve, we can popularize our age-old traditional formative foods of Asia or even in the world. Dhaneva. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Tama. Uh, all right. Uh, this, uh, uh, we have listened to the presentation of Patia from very extraordinary presenter. Yeah. Uh, so uh, now we come to the question and answer session. Uh, please, if you want to uh, make a question to Professor Tama. Uh, you can uh, raise your hand or uh, with chat. Where is uh, any question? Maybe from the student first. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Okay. From Saifuddin uh, Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mrs. Prof. Rato. Uh, introduce myself. My name is Saifuddin. My nickname is Saif. I'm from uh, Cirebon, West Java, Indonesia. Uh, I'm student biology, biology uh, master in Unpad. Uh, from far to Professor Prakas Tamang, uh, export of frozen fish to China and Japan from Cirebon. Uh, gave greatly increased, but not uh, with fermentation fish. Uh, uh, short uh, report fish quarantine in uh, 20, 2000 and 2020 years. Uh, export of frozen and fermentation fish to India, there is uh, not yet. Uh, my question is, uh, how is fermentation fish process but doesn't change the quality and test. Uh, and then uh, about database, bioinformatics, and metagenomics. Uh, my question is, what is the correlation between uh, bioinformatics, database, and metagenomic application? And then what information is in database for use bioinformatics and metagenomics? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Prof. Oh. Uh, and uh, my question is three questions. Thank you. Yeah, Prof. Tamang. Uh, hello. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I could not understand your questions. Can you just uh, very briefly? Uh, the oh. question first, first question, uh, how is fermentation fish process pass, but doesn't change the quality and test? Oh. Okay. Uh, and then what is micro microorganism species for good fermentation fish? Okay, and now <clears throat> that's a very good question. Uh, so to improve the quality, first, uh, first of all, we have to study the indigenous uh, microflora. So to know the microflora now, uh, because I told you that in the cultural methods, we may not isolate uh, the all type of the microorganisms because <coughs> some are non-culturable. And some are culturable, but they, they are not uh, being enumerated uh, the profusely. <clears throat> so what we do is that the metatonomic studies, when we take the DNA of the sample, that we get the entire microbial communities. And we also get the, functional, uh, the, uh, the functionality of each and every uh, OTU or the metagenome or the gene of that uh, particular organism. <clears throat> After getting all the information and all, 
then we come to know that which is the most abundant and which organism uh, is producing or uh, <coughs> excuse me Then once we get the entire uh, functional profiles of the microorganisms, then which has got the more antimicrobial activities, which has uh, which can suppress the other microorganisms and all. So we can again now revisit to the cultural method. Then we use the spe uh, the special <coughs> selective media. <coughs> to isolate that particular microorganism uh, to isolate in the cultural form. Then after that, we can make the starter culture. It is helpful for the thing. Then we can make the fish product, uh, the, raw, the raw materials we get it, then we uh, ferment the fish product. And these pro uh, fish products will definitely have the, uh, the longer longevity and some, uh, the longer shelf life and uh, the uh, several other functional properties. And it may have some antimicrobial activities and it may have some uh, bacteria and so that the other spoilers organisms may not come so that it will be safe. Okay. Yeah. Uh, have you got the answer from the prof? Tama, uh, Pak Saifuddin? Uh, enough. <coughs> Empat, uh, second. Uh, uh, masih uh, ada second, pertanyaan ya? Uh, second question, Prof. Oh, oke. Okay. Uh, Pak uh, there is some, uh, the second question from Saifuddin. Uh, Please, Pak Saifuddin. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Uh, <coughs> about uh, database, bioinformatics, and metagenomics uh, my question is what is the correlation uh, between bioinformatics database and metagenomics application and then what information is in database for use bioinformatics and metagenomics uh, thank you uh, Prof. so i already explained to you that what uh, the information depends on the put to put, then what uh, information you get it. Because once you get the metagenomics and the metabolomics data, then you come to know that how many uh, metabolites are present in that particular food. And then accordingly, you can extract and you can do the other uh, other experiments like the immunomodulators and all. But these are the basic micro, these are the basic uh, studies. The, this is not a basic, it's a very advanced studies. But these are the basic informations which are very needed. So you get the, once you do the uh, metagenomics, you get the entire uh, biome that is called the microorganism, both the uh, bacteria uh, and the other also. Then there are certain bacteriophages also. There are uh, archaea also. There are some yeast also, fungi also. So you get uh, the role of each and every microorganism, whether it's a major, abundance or whether it is a minor, you get an entire pictures and which organisms is responsible for production of that each biotic compound. You get a knowledge so that you can target that microorganisms in your next studies. <clears throat> I think it is satisfied. You are on mute. I'm not hearing. Sabitri, you. Uh, Mr. Gilang yeah. wants to uh, make a question to you, Professor. Uh, 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 uh. Okay. 
that. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you uh, very much uh, for the time. Hello, Professor Tamang. Uh, it is glad to see you here since the first time in Thailand, maybe in, in 2010 in Professor Charun seminar. And then we also met in 2015 and the last in 2019 in Anand. Uh, me with Professor Tita. Uh, really glad to uh, always uh, correspond uh, with you. So we see now uh, we're also doing some research in Terasi, like Indonesian fermented uh, paste, uh, fermented fish, uh, fish paste, or uh, some uh, uh, shrimp, shrimp paste, uh, like that. We're also uh, doing some amplicon uh, approach, but we're still uh, looking for the analysis. So you, you show some analysis in uh, principal component analysis or something like correlation analysis uh, between the uh, amplicon or metagenomic with the uh, metabolites uh, that analyze from the uh, fermented foods. But uh, in our research, we also detect the gamma amino butyric acid, uh, how the uh, lactic acid bacteria or also the yeast uh, can produce uh, gamma amino butyric acid from the uh, glutamic acid and everything. So uh, the, the point is, uh, it is possible if, if we still analyze it with the descriptive uh, approach or not, uh, we are not doing the like a principal uh, component analysis or like a correlation analysis between the gamma amino butyric acid or the amplicon for the composition of the microorganism such uh, like that. Uh, maybe uh, there is uh, my question. Thank you very much, Professor Tama. Thank you. Yeah. What is your question? Uh, we we do some uh, research. Uh, we we do some amplicon analysis for terasi in fermented food, and we also have the gamma amino butyric acid uh, data like that. So uh, we still not uh, get the point uh, how uh, how come we, we can correlate or we will make an analysis with uh, the uh, like principal component analysis like that. So we're still doing the uh, descriptical analysis. It is uh, possible to, to do the, the, the analysis like that, the, the, the simple, not, not too complex analysis for the metagenomic uh, uh, research like that. Uh, yes, you can do that also. There's no problem. You can do. <clears throat> I mean, you you want to do or uh, you like uh, me to do? Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. We we still try to make a descriptical because we have the composition of the microorganism. I'll tell you. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See. <clears throat> Metagenomics uh, studies, as I told you, is uh, uh, is quite complicated because you need uh, some training uh, for that. Okay. Oh. So usually in the previously in the 16s RNA sequencing, uh, the identification was not a problem because just uh, isolate the DNA, then go for the uh, DNA sequencing, and you get a raw matters uh, the data. Then you go for the blast, which is very common, and yep. it is uh, freely down, uh, uh, downloaded, and you can submit to the NCBS. But metagenomics is not like that. You need a very, very strong knowledge in the bioinformatics. Uh -huh. Unless or until, if you do not have the knowledge on the bioinformatics, and which is the machine learning, and the machine learning is the subject in the computer science, especially in the MTech, Master in Computer Engineering, it is a two years course. So, so it is a very, 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 very difficult. Uh, I mean, of course, it's a thing. So we did because uh, we work on that uh, uh, and on this analysis, the team which has got the very strong bioinformatics cannot do in the metagenomics. That is the thing. The analysis is not a problem. But the, after analysis, the raw materials, the raw sequences you get, 
you have to decode it. It takes time, and you need a you get an expertise on the computer by informatics and all. And you should have a very strong uh, the <clears throat> workstation. The uh, RAM should be more than 196, and very strong. Uh, you know the software and <clears throat> knowledge on the thing because it will come in the uh, the language, the computer languages. Yeah. So these languages has to be studied, and <clears throat> then you have to comment it. Then on the the is is a stepping and all. Then unless or until if you do not have the binder. So my suggestions to you is then uh, in probably in Indonesia also you have some computer science in some universities or you may have some uh, engineering universities and all. So they are working on the uh, artificial uh, intelligence. Nowadays, artificial intelligence AI is very important in the cyber crime in all making the all type of the software and all. But <clears throat> very few of them are interested in the biological science. So I think in the medical science also nowadays, the prediction of the cancer, the, uh, the uh, mitigation of the cancer, some immune, uh, uh, immune system diseases, these are now the medical uh, scientists are also very interested in the bioinformatics. They use it. In India, many uh, top uh, hospitals, they use bioinformatics. In America also, in Japan also. I think, I don't know, if in Indonesia also. So you ask them. You have to collaborate with them. <clears throat> Maybe they are working and some companies also do it. So if you collaborate with, because for you to learn Com uh, computer is very difficult because we should you should have a very good knowledge in the mathematics, right? But it's a completely different subject. But you have to tie up with them. So if you tie up with them, <clears throat> and definitely they they, they uh, then then they can analyze this and you can get their data and all. And for me, I can train that, but uh, you you because you need to stay here for one year. Because on this and until one year, you cannot do it's, it's not a matter of two days or three days or a week or like that. Theoretical, yeah. I can teach. There's no problem. Theoretical, I can teach you the bioinformatics and all. But uh, practically, I cannot do that. You have to practice here and sit it and all. It's quite, that is the, that is, that is the only the thing. And it is not a matter of one or two days also. It takes a lot of time. It's not expensive. Nothing, nothing. Yeah. You need only computer knowledge and you get a very strong um, the workstations of that also because it needs no chemicals no primers nothing and all but it needs our practice and the expertise and you should have a very good uh, server very good uh, strong uh, the <clears throat> the workstations so in our laboratory we have set up that also <clears throat> yes okay thank you very much Dr. Uh, professor Tama. Uh, Thank you. Any other questions? Not audible. Savitri is not audible. Still muted. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, there is some uh, question from Ibu Yolani in uh, chat room. Uh, I would like to read it. Uh, she wanted to know about the shotgun. Eh, Ibu Yolani ada di sini? Ya. Yeah. Ada, Bu. Oh, Oke, okay. you can uh, make question direct to Professor Tama. Oke, okay, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, thank you for your great presentation. Uh, is it everyone? Yolani. Uh, yes, is it everyone hear my voice? Yes. Okay, I'm so sorry I couldn't open the camera because of the signal problem. Uh, I wonder to know about a shotgun uh, sequence. Uh, I want to know how many limit based pair they read in shotgun sequence. And uh, for bioinformatic application, uh, what is the application do you use? So there are, <clears throat> see, <clears throat> in the shotgun, uh, sequence, <clears throat> it is called the library preparations. It will go mostly the protein sequences and all. So there is a uh, there is some techniques and all. Then you get the you have to run it. Then after that you get a sequence. The the sequence uh, generated by the 
shotgun and the, the sequence uh, generated by the Empricone, it looks the same. But once you go and that you have to arrange in the bioinformatics, and there are certain uh, the pipelines, what we call the pipelines. There are different types of the pipelines uh, in, in the, uh, the coatings, and it is a coke, it is a KGG, that there are so many different types of the pipelines and you have to fit it within that pipelines of this sequence. <clears throat> I cannot explain you now theoretically because on this and on really it is shown in the computer and all. So it takes time. So that raw sequence, once you get it, then we do the quality uh, test. Then after that, the each sequence will be arranged and sh should be uh, input into that uh, software. And most of the software are free of cost. We don't have to buy nowadays. Previously, we used to have to, we had to buy. Nowadays, every every software is uh, prepared, and whoever uh, prepares the software and it is being uh, in the public domain. And software, uh, you can download any software. But the problem is that downloading software is not a problem. But understanding the software, then opening the software. And using the application software is very important. So <laughs> and you analyze need to the it basic is knowledge very... at that. Yeah. Software is no problem. You can do that. Mm -hmm. So what do the thing? So if they, it is a resource is like that only. So that is why <clears throat> the, it varies from the, uh, the team to team. Okay. The the sometimes and even we what we have tried is that there is a hundred. Uh, <clears throat> there is a abundance. What we call the more than one percent abundance. So usually uh, to, to, uh, to detect the domains above 1% is quite easy. But the, there are so many other organisms, mostly the unculturable, which are below 1%. So people don't like to go that because it's a very tedious. Every time you have to put it, then you have to recheck the software and all. Then only you can give a taxonomical unit, taxonomical assignment. Then ultimately, once you get the, the different types of the figures and all, and you have to make it in the readable form, in the tabular form, or in the graph, or something like that also. So it needs uh, some technique and it needs a practice. What I said that the persons, only those who have a knowledge in the computer analysis and mostly the bioinformatics, then they can do. And for the last question, can we analyze the sequence until microbi mi microbial uh, species or only until genus? No, we, you can uh, you can identify any any organism. There's no problem if it is a. No, no, I mean, uh, for a ta taxonomy rank, can we analyze yeah. it until species or only no. until genus? Amplicon amplicon uh, sequence uh, mostly. Of course, with the amplicon sequence, we have identified of the species level, but uh, especially the uh, some people may not accept the species level identified the certain sequence, uh, the, the amplicon sequencing. But up to genesis, okay, no problem. Even the species also, we can do that also. But the certain sequencing is go up to the species, subspecies, even the strains and all also. Certain is very powerful. If you use the certain, there's no problem. Ah, okay, I get it. Okay, thank you very much. You uh -huh. uh, yeah, I got it. I'm happy to get it. Thank <laughs> you very much. Thank you. I'm not hearing Savitri. Yes, still mute. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Pesa Jatnika, Mas Yada, di sana, happy day. Okay, please. So much for the chance. Hello, my name is Faisal. So I would like to ask about uh, your study. So actually, I am interested with the yeah. I never imagined about uh, food, uh, food ethnobiologic. Yeah, combined with the how to high throughput high throughput sequence. So uh, yeah, or NGI something. And I would like to ask uh, two questions. First is, uh, I would like to on I would like to know about your uh, opinion based on your uh, experience. Uh, which is a better technique for meta metagenomic study about ethno microbiology? Yeah, 
uh, between high throughput sequence and shotgun sequence? I would like to know. And uh, could you give me the reasons why you choose uh, that technique? And then the second question is, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I saw I saw you your studies. Uh, your uh, your research are many. Yeah, are many. Hello. Yes. Your research are many uh, variations of fermented food. So I would like to know that uh, majority of uh, fermented foods, which is more diverse between a uh, culturable microorganism and uh, unculturable microorganism. So perhaps we can, maybe we can uh, culture or isolate the, the, the most abundance. And then maybe we can, uh, what is it? Maybe we can uh, get more uh, benefits from uh, that microorganism. Okay, that's my questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> my, my answer is very simple. Um, out of this uh, high throughput, which is amplicant sequencing and the shotgun, as I told you that amplicant sequencing will go only for bacteria and even for the yeast, uh, you have to do again. But the shotgun sequencing will go up to everything, up to species, so I prefer the shotgun sequencing. But the shotgun sequencing in the cost-wise and the time-wise shotgun sequencing is quite expensive, quite uh, tedious. It takes a lot of time. So uh, this can be done on the, in the very well-established laboratories uh, the, where the facilities are there. We do that. But the, and another is in the shotgun, one is Suppose there are 100 uh, samples in the other. So we have isolated the 100 DNA. So if you want to do the shotgun of the 100, it's too expensive and too tedious uh, work to do the all the 100 DNA, okay? So for one, you need at least two, three months and for the 100, it takes a lot of time. So what we have done is that now we have devised one technique, which is called the full sequence. The, there is a statistical, we combine the DNA and we make it as a full sequence. And from that 100 or something like, we can make it, uh, they represent it maybe two, three or five. So that once it is being done, then we can decode it that uh, full sequence and it gets the accurate uh, representation of all the things. This is also highly acceptable. Now your second question is the culturable and unculturable. The culturable organisms are very easy to handle. As I told you, the unculturable or the metatonomics will get only the entire picture of that. Then only you can target. Otherwise, in the cultural, you do not know anything. You just take the sample, the plate it, and colonies. Again, you have to do this, 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 this. It's a very tedious. But before that, if you take the DNA and do the shotgun and do all metatonomics, and you get an entire picture of that. The useless organisms, which does not have any role, you should not concern. You should not. Uh, concentrate on that. You just point on that. Only those abundant which has got a high functionality, you try to use the specific organism, then definitely you'll be able to get it that culture, then you can purify that and you can do more studies on that. I think that is satisfied to your question. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, one question, is it okay? Okay, so uh, do you have any study uh, after you uh, perform uh, NGS analysis for uh, uh, fermented food? Have you checked like a metabolomics st studies? Yes, we are doing. Oh, are doing you are the metabolomics. Doing. I told oh. you, I, told you. I, I oh. given my results. So you combine it. The yes, sir. Whole genome sequence, we are doing everything. Ah, oh, I see. Oh, that's very great. That's very good. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. uh, take a break. <laughs> the Protama, because <laughs> many, uh, many uh, audience, uh, very interesting, interest to your uh, presentation. But uh, no, uh, Miss Rena, Miss Rena, can you still there? Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you for the the opportunity prof ratu and i want to ask a uh, uh, study uh, the stem stuff study to europe 
And if it can, how to choose the area, community, or population uh, for ethnomicrobiology? And second um, question, what is the challenge or obstacle study metagenomics? Uh, remember that uh, the scope of metagenomic is very large, uh, very complex, and involve many countries. That's my question. Thank you. Uh, what was your question first? Ethnomicrobiology, what did you say? Can we apply the same stuff, uh, yes, meta yes, metagenomic, yes. metagenomic to Europe? Europe, uh, Europe. To Europe? Europe, yes. Can we apply the European, same stuff? In the European fermented food? Yeah. In the Europe, Europe fermented Europe, food? Europe, yeah. Yes, of yeah. course. Obviously, many many of my friends are using that uh, with the metagenomics in the European food because Europe in the Europe uh, there are several uh, the traditional milk products. So there are different type of the uh, the cheese products, okay, traditionally prepared, and some are very exotic, some are very rare also, and there are many fermented uh, sauces also, very confined to the different. <coughs> special regions. And there is a wine also. Uh, some wine is very particular. So these are all being the age old, traditionally being prepared for uh, thousands and thousands of years. So uh, the uh, uh, yes, some, uh, some friends are studying on that. There's no problem. They're studying everywhere. Yeah, how to choose in the fact, area for a population. Fact, uh, they, in fact, the metagenomic studies and the metabolites are more popular in Europe, uh, European foods, because they have a facilities and there are many scientists and all. But in Asia, there are done very few. Only in India, <clears throat> that is also my laboratory, and uh, I don't know in other laboratories, and in few, one or two in Japan, and uh, one or two in China. I don't think in other areas they are doing. But this is just has come, but I'm trying to encourage all my friends in Asia to initiate this. And we have, uh, if I visit uh, Indonesia, uh, uh, if the COVID is uh, being relaxed and if uh, Professor Tida and uh, Professor Savitri invites me, I can get some food and I do the metagenomics and collaborate with you, there's no problem. I need only the food sample. <clears throat> I can collect it and do analysis in, that's what I did in from Myanmar and I did in Korea also. Now I was about to go to China also in the Southern China, but because of the COVID I couldn't do. Because we need only small samples that much we can do. But my question is that <clears throat> analysis is not a problem, but what is very important thing is that, because today's topic is the metagenomics, but the most important thing is that metagenomics is very highly advanced in the fermented food. But it doesn't mean that you have to go there. You have to go for the basic. The students should know that what is what is the difference between the bacteria and the yeast? What is the difference between the yeast and the fungi? Basic knowledge in the food microbiology should be there. And how to isolate that? And how to study the field? And I have shown you that protocol that is very important because metagenomics will come in the last. First is any food, anything which Gilang was saying that, and another uh, gentleman was saying that any food, any fish product or any meat product or any vegetable product, any any anything of Indonesia, which has not been uh, studied and which has been consumed in only by the particular the, the few uh, people, ethnic people, this is also very important. If you do not study this food and document this food, and this food will get then the uh, disappear. Then the old persons who are making this food have died. So the younger persons are not interested to prepare that food. Then the whole microorganism, the whole metabolites, whatever the, we talk about, everything will disappear from this earth. So our idea is to document that, to popularize that, and that will give the more thing is that your history, the food culture of Indonesia, the preservation of the traditional knowledge at the same time, you may get a good noble microorganisms 
that may have some different type of the biofunctional properties in future that may be done also. So this is my message to all the things. Metadonomics is okay. Everybody cannot try that. But to, to reach that level, you should have that basic knowledge. Okay, get it. May, um, maybe uh, second second question is, uh, what is the challenge or obstacle from from your experience to study metagenomics? Um, well, challenge is you should have a facility, you should have a knowledge in the bioinformatics. That is under the challenge. The challenge is uh, the it is a machine learning because computer. Everybody knows computer, but uh, now the computer is has become a so uh, you know dependent because now the computer, the artificial media will identify all uh, organisms. Okay, so we should know that also. We should know the how to command it. Automatically, they will not do. So that is the challenge. So challenge is in your uh, Indonesia university, you must introduce uh, bioinformatics other biological computations in your university immediately in the undergraduate and the postgraduate or if not then the, some training should be there so bioinformatics nowadays uh, there was a molecular now everybody is doing the molecular biology but bioinformatics is very important so you must ask your government to introduce higher education minister ministry of higher education to introduce the bioinformatics or biological computations in each and every uh, the universities, then the students will learn, some, uh, some expert will come, then definitely, then you can use many things, uh, the food industries and even the biomedical, even the drug modulations, bioinformatics is very important. Okay, thank you. That is the challenge. <laughs> okay, uh, only seven minutes remain, yeah. Uh, Prof. Endang, do you want some question? Make some question to Professor Tamang. Prof. Endang. Yes. Uh, yeah. Oh, you're here. I thought that uh, you were gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. I'm still here. I'm listening until to the end. Oh, good, good. Yeah, good. I, yeah, yeah. Un unfortunately, uh, I am I am not doing a lot on uh, what you call it uh, microorganisms in yeah, yeah. Uh, fermented food. But mm -hmm. actually, since uh, my research, uh, our team research. Uh, related to probiotic and during the clinical trials, we also analyze the fecal materials, check their gut microbiota. So actually, almost the same method we use to analyze microorganisms in the fecal materials. Yeah, we, we use the same, the same method. Uh, that's uh, uh, what you call it. Uh, I, I really appreciate that you really have a good data on uh, what you call it, uh, microbiome, microbiome, microbiota on uh, fermented food. Yeah, I really, uh, you, your, your work is really great. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. A lot of Thank information. May, may I ask a little about... Uh, for example, if we understand that uh, there is a very important uh, metabolites, yeah, metabolites, yeah, several metabolites in uh, fermented food, how we connect, yeah, how we connect to the microorganism which uh, produce this uh, metabolite. I, I, I still, I still. Uh, I, I still cannot understand how to connect the genomic belong to certain microorganisms that produce important metabolites in the, the fermented product. Yeah. What you do is that <laughs> if you have some probiotic bacteria, Okay, so you have isolated some. No, 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 not not probiotic. Any, any, any. For example, we understand that. Uh, oh, better, okay. Uh, in uh, fermented food, uh, 
have a certain important metabolites. Uh, metabolites. Yes, right. Who That's produced German. this? Yes, yes, yes. Who produced this is, uh, metabolites? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It is uh, the metabolomics is studied by the LCMS and the GCMS. Yes. Liquid right. chromatography and gas chromatography. So yes, we have right. tried the both. So liquid chromatography will have more volatiles and because the targeted is amino mm. acid, fatty acid and all. Untargeted is quite difficult because there are so many uh, the unclassified metabolites. So that from there, you can use this LCMS and GCMS method. It's a right. quite a tedious method. Then you get a peak. Then that peak has to be uh, the integrated into the KEGG uh, database. And here in the metabol in the in the predictive metabolic is also you use the KGG. There's a software where all type of information the metabolites are here in the predictive and in the metabolite. So you compare mm -hmm. that. So which is the mm -hmm. predictive by the metagenomes and which is the which we call the real time experiment that is the using the LGMS yes. or GCMS. Right. So the metabolite. Yes. And you connect that also. So definitely it will get and this in the metabolites, you get only the metabolites, only the name of the compound. Of course, you have to decode that peak. Mm -hmm. But in the predictive functionality, because you are working, we are doing from the metagenome generated by the shotgun, the bacteria are there. So which bacteria, which organism? Right. Yes, right. This type of thing. Yes, definitely. We have done, I've shown the slides. I've shown my figure. Okay. In cinema, we have sure, done. thank you. We have done that. We have successful. Okay, thank you. Thank I, you. I don't, yes. know, I don't know that this has been done. Very few papers I have not seen. But this paper is under construction. So yes. Maybe within uh, three, four months, this paper will be published. Then I'll send to you. So this is the... Yeah. Okay. This is the... Thank you. Because uh, we also would like to analyze certain metabolome exactly. in yes, the, yes. what you call it, the, our fecals, yeah? Mm. And then we also want to know what's the microorganisms responsible on it. Okay, mm. thank you very much. Please send me uh, you papers. Just, you, yeah, you just wait for sometimes, once this paper is published, okay. you can follow up <laughs> yes. the methodology. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Buratu. Mm. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss with uh, Prof. Chyoti. See you. Ah, see you next thank week. You, thank you, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. See you okay. Yeah, see you next week in Tokyo. Thank you very much, Prof. Enda, for participation. Uh, I have some questions, but uh, the time is only two minutes again. Uh, that uh, we have, uh, we come to the end part of the, this session. Uh, and thank you for uh, enthusiastic the uh, of the uh, of the audience yeah uh, and very interesting uh, material uh, very interesting presentation but uh, ibunya akan menutup ibunya yeah 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 prof ratu yeah yeah uh... Thank you very much uh, for great presentation and uh, for your uh, research and publication and uh, all of things about uh, your presentation is uh, useful. I think for my uh, for for me for our children. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Prakas. Uh, Talking about uh, ethnomicrobiology, uh, I think we are in uh, Indonesia. Uh, we are in uh, Asia. In Asia, uh, uh, as you know, that Indonesia have one thousand uh, and three hundred ethnic. Yeah, uh, in seventeen thousand island. Yeah. So it's multicultural archipelagic, <laughs> yeah, for Indonesia. Uh, uh, it's in the same thing with, with uh, your uh, talk, talk is uh, about uh, fermentation food. 
in like in Java, uh, Java uh, in West Java, we have uh, as you know uh, tape, yeah, cassava okay. fermentation, yeah, sticky rice, sticky rice uh, uh, fer fermentation, yeah, sticky rice, and a lot of like terasi, uh, what uh, gemi, uh, gilang say that terasi terasi uh, belacan in Malaysia is, is the same thing ya yeah. is the same thing is shrimp paste ya yeah. so i think it's a challenge ya yeah. uh, i agree with prof prakas uh, that uh, is challenge for us in asia university uh, if we have collaboration uh, in uh, uh, research about uh, fermentation uh, especially in, in ethnomicrobiology yeah uh, thank yes, you yes. very much for uh, presentation is uh, great for us uh, to have you uh, join uh, with us and uh, excuse me prof nia and prof ratu safitri before we forget yeah. i think we should give a certificate of appreciation yeah, for yeah. prof tamang yeah yeah so, thank yeah. you very much uh, alisa <laughs> yeah yes. i wait i wait for this <laughs> <laughs> okay so if uh, if i'm um, sorry so i would like to have a uh, i would like to share this certificate for prof tamang uh, so and will be given by uh, Prof Nia or Prof Ratu? Okay. I think, uh, okay. Yeah. So this is the certificate. Please, you can uh, try to send it to Prof Tamang. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yeah. So in uh, in behalf of our dean, uh, Professor Dr. Iman Rahayu, and also our head of department, Dr. Budi Irawan, uh, I'm. I'm very honored to present you, Prof. Uh, Tamang, with this certificate of appreciation. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your knowledge and your uh, great information. Uh, may we have a great relationship in the future. And I hope we will have more news for you and also more collaboration between our department, our faculty, and your, uh, your university as well. So thank you very much, uh, Prof. Tama. Thank you, Prof. Ratu and Prof. Nia for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I leave now? Oh, that's thank you very uh, much. that's up to Prof. Nia. Okay, <laughs> okay. Dr. Savitri, can I leave? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Prof. Tama. Thank you very much. Uh, see you uh, in the next time. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much, everyone, for your time and support. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.